It's minutes before what's considered the biggest festival of the year for the Taoists, the Jade Emperor's birthday. There's one common thing that I can find on all the tables, and that's Ang Ku Kui. Where the deities go, the food offerings go. That's how culture gets propagated uh, around the world. Kuei is an entire genre of Southeast Asian snacks, made more colourful by centuries of trade, innovation and war. Being able to eat a kuei would be a special treat. A little bit of pleasure in hard times. Why not? I'm Justin Fu, and I've spent most of my time as a chef making European cakes and cuisine. In this documentary, I'm returning to my roots and visiting some of the most notable kuei makers in Singapore. People keep thinking that Ang Ku Kuei is actually Peranakan, but it has its origin from Fujian, China. Join me as I go on a culinary adventure unearthing the untold stories behind these dainty delectables. You taste the difference? The coconut flavour is very pronounced. Unveil their roots as fusion foods of their time. When you have kuih lapis from Indonesia, the best quality ones always will use this Dutch butter. And discover what these yummy delights can tell us about Southeast Asia. If you see this steamer, you know that it's putu piring. No other kuehs in the world would use this. It's the eighth day of the Chinese New Year and the eve of the Jade Emperor's birthday. There are still a few hours to go before celebrations kick off at midnight. But preparations are already in full swing. Devotees have been streaming in since 2 p.m. and they're here early to secure a spot for their offerings to the Jade Emperor, who in Taoism is the supreme ruler of the three realms, heaven, earth and the sea. And among all the offerings, the tribute of choice seems to be this, the Ang Ku Kui. It's 30 minutes to midnight and this place is just jam-packed full of people. People here can actually celebrate this at home and yet they choose to come here to this very temple. As I walk across the tables, there's one common thing that I can find and that's Ang Ku Kui. But it wasn't easy getting these mountains of Ang Ku Kui ready for the altar. I should know, because hours ago, I was in the thick of the action. That's Kelvin, and he's the one in charge of a 48-hour marathon at Zixiang to make and sell 10,000 Ang Ku Kuei's which is why he has summoned me to the shop. Hi, Kevin. Hey. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You're here to help, right? Uh, of course, I'm ready. I got your gear ready here. Thank you. Put it on. So what am I doing today? You're going to help me pack and sell a lot quick. Today is the busiest day of the year for us. Usually, I'm always behind the kitchen, uh, but at least I have a guide here to help me remember the prices. It's pretty busy now. Each time I'm selling, I'm selling more than one box. I've been selling for about 30 minutes and I've sold about 35 boxes and it's not stopping. And still, the packing is going on over there and there's a line outside. There's probably like 10 people. And I realised that half of the quiz that I've sold here is for the prayers, for the Jade Emperor's birthday. Okay, Justin, we are running out of kuih. Mm. So we are still making a lot of kuih behind. Okay. So I need you to pack them in six. All right. Just lay them out in six. So you are very important because you are the last person to see the kuih. Mm. You see, I have this piece of kuih here. It's, right. Uh, that, that you have to reject. Okay. Especially for the money kuih. Because you don't want broken money to be given out to the customer. How is the Ang Kui being used in this uh, celebration? All these kuih are meant for the offering table. We offer up the Ang Kui, the Ang Yi, and the Mani Kui. 
Mani Kue is a form of Ang Ku Kue. Along with Ang Yi, that's made specially for the Jade Emperor's birthday. Together with the tortoiseshell original, they represent the devotee's wishes for wealth, prosperity, and longevity. Everyone wants to pray to the Jade Emperor at midnight to be the first to wish him happy birthday, to get the best blessing. If you do it later in the day, the Jade Emperor got no more energy for your blessing. That's the story behind it. Where did this custom come from? It's more of a Taoist tradition that originated from China. So mainly the Hokkien are the ones that follow this practice. China itself don't really follow a lot of practice and custom after the Cultural Revolution, but we still follow our roots. So it's up to us Singaporeans, Malaysians, to keep this tradition and custom alive. Can I get one set for the table? Of course. So how many pieces do you want? I don't know. Um, what should I get? How hot do you want to be? I want very, very, very hot. You should get the full set, 12 of each. One piece for each month of the year that you receive blessing from the heavens. You know where to pack, right? Uh, go and pack yourself. Go, 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 go. I have 36 Anku Kueh to take part in the Jade Emperor's birthday celebrations. I've never done this before, but I'm told that this is going to bring me maximum fortune. Benjamin is a Taoist priest who has conducted prayers for this festival for 12 years. Why is the Jade Emperor's birthday such a significant affair? In the past, um, Taoism was a shamanistic uh, way of praying. So people pray to the environment, to heaven and earth and water. Jade Emperor is like the president of the three realms, the heaven, the earth and the sea. People want to say thanks to him. So they actually choose his birthday. I see a lot of deities here. Okay, so here in, that I don't see like a Jade Emperor statue. People actually pray to the heaven. They believe that the Jade Emperor is there, you know. Doesn't need a statue because he's a ruler. His presence is felt. Is Angkor Kuei a must-have on the table when offering to the Jade Emperor? Traditionally, it's, it's, it's a must-have. So what do people pray for actually? They pray for wealth, longevity, and also for prosperity. And in Chinese culture, so you see this Angkor Kuei over here, it's in the shape of the money. So this is for wealth, and this is for longevity because it's like a turtle shell, and turtle signifies long life. And also the Ang Yi, where in Chinese culture, Yuan Yuan Man Man. It is round, so everything to be on a prosperous side. This actually originated from Wuxian. So uh, the practice may date back like 4,000 over years when Taoism first started. The tortoise is a sacred and auspicious animal because it actually has a long life. Therefore, it's used to represent longevity, good fortune and uh, good luck. From worship of uh, the tortoise, which is pre-Taoism, pre-Buddhism, the Angkor Kui become a link to that very, very old past of Chinese civilization. When the Hokkien people started to move further south, mainly for trade, into the Malay archipelago, naturally their worship came along and they bring along the Angkor Kui into the Malay archipelago. That signifies the start of the Jade Emperor's birthday. The chief priest is going around blessing the offerings the devotees brought, so that those who take a bite out of them will be blessed with good fortune for the rest of the year. I've been eating Angkor Kueh all my life, but I had no idea that this kueh had traditions that go so far back. As a foodie and a chef, I need to learn how to make this age-old recipe. So I'm returning to Jixiang for Kelvin to show me the process from start to finish. 
this has been cooking for 15 minutes, it's ready. So what we cooked just now is just uh, water and flour. This is more like a binding agent. So right now we can add in the rest of the ingredient. Glutinous rice flour. So, and then add a bit of oil, water and sugar. A bit of mixing and the dough will be ready. It's actually a very simple dough to make. Now that the dough is all done, yes. we are going to shape them, right? Correct. Okay, so show me how to make one and right. I will learn from you. We are making the Tao Sa Sui Mang Bi filling today. I'll do it real slow for you. Put the filling in the middle, turn it around, cover it up. It goes into the mold. Give it a good tap. And this is the banana leaf we are using. That's it. How long have you been making Ang Ku Kueh? My mom started making Ang Ku Kueh in 1986. So it's been 36 years. Did the recipe change at all? So I like to tell people that this version of Ang Ku Kueh is actually version 3. The China version 1, and then the Peranakan version 2, my mom version 3. So in China versus the Ang Ku Kueh that you do here, What's the main difference? The whole recipe is totally different. The banana leaf is what we use in Singapore. In China, they use another broad leaf that they can find locally. The main difference from the China one is the filling. It's savoury. So, Ang Ku Kueh from China uh, was brought to Singapore back then, during the Great Migration, where a lot of Chinese immigrants came to the Malaccan Straits. That's where the Peranakans got to make Ang Ku Kueh. People keep thinking that Ang Ku Kueh is actually Peranakan, but it has its origin from uh, Fujian, China. Because of the local ingredients, the Peranakan started using coconut milk. They made it uh, not a savoury item, but uh, more like a dessert. Do they still eat it today in yes. Fujian, China? Every household in Fujian, China has a different Ang Ku Kueh mold that's handmade, and it's not like ours, which is generic. Ours is considered still Peranakan style, mainly from the filling and the texture of the skin. But our version is uh, made so that we take into consideration our production and the shelf life. We change it a bit to suit uh, mass production. We don't use coconut milk because uh, it makes the kueh turn rancid really fast. It's my first time. It was pretty decent. Can sell? <laughs> or half price. Half price. <laughs> Okay, not bad, not bad. At least they still make money. Yeah. So Kelvin says the Angku Kueh that we know today was shaped by the Peranakans. But what changes did they make? I think I need to ask someone who is Peranakan. Chinese migrants set sail for Southeast Asia, bringing along customs and foods that have survived the test of time. But I'm told that the Peranakans were the ones who shaped the Angku Kueh into the sweet dessert that we are familiar with today. The Peranakan communities formed through the intermarriage between Chinese migrants especially merchants in the earlier periods like the Ming and Qing era and uh, local women from within the archipelago. Benjamin Sik is a sixth-generation Peranakan who serves up traditional Nonya fare at True Blue Cuisine. How long have you been making Ang Ku Kueh? Since young, but we don't use the word Ang Ku Kueh in the Peranakan family. We call it Kueh Ku. Can you show me how to make Kueh Ku? Of course, definitely. Kueh is Hokkien for the Chinese character Guo. It usually refers to snacks made from rice ground into powder, and the term has been adopted into Malay to refer to a wide range of sweet delights. Benjamin, so how do we make the fillings? Okay, basically you need mung bean. So you soak them uh, overnight, then um, you steam them with lots of pandan leaves to give the flavour. After steaming, you smash it, it comes out like that. Then you just add in um, coconut cream and sugar. 
the nonyas add coconut in it to give the lemak taste. Lemak is like more richer taste, more buttery taste. You even use coconut cream for the dough. Mm. Mm. So I guess this practice doesn't come from the Chinese, right? No, this comes from the Malay. Actually. The Malay side of the yes, family, right? Yes, yes. For the kueh ku filling for the nonya culture, has it always been mung beans? Yeah, definitely mung beans. For traditional Ranakan uh, kueh ku, right? No peanuts inside. Mung beans are very small, the beans are a lot, so multiply, so when you eat, you multiply your wealth. Peanuts is only used for cooking, not for kuei. Why is that so? Because kueis are normally used for good occasions and also for tea times. Because the Branakan families normally gamble at home in the afternoon. So afternoon when they play, they have to prepare kueis for their guests to eat. Those old ladies that come to the house and play, they are very particular in food. You must serve the best of the best. This is why kuei is normally different from food again. Branakan are very particular. What they are brought up to eat, they always stick on that taste. They don't like to change their food. This is why it's handed down generation after generation. Yeah. Okay, so what do you do okay. from here? We need to make the dough. Then um, you put in um, the sweet potato. Then of course water, coconut milk. Then the red colouring. The very important part is actually the sweet potato. When we add sweet potato into the dough, it makes the dough soft. After steaming, it will not be hardened. It's still very soft till the next day. Why we add coconut milk? We want the rich flavour. That coconut gives a nice flavour. A lot of these flavours are very familiar to me as a Southeast Asian. Who started putting these ingredients into these kueh? It's the ladies. Of course, the ladies are always in the kitchen, right? Our ancestors, um, the ladies are Malay. They love to cook uh, food with coconut ingredients that you can get it easily locally. Branakan food is a fusion of Chinese and Malay back all the way to 14th century to today. We have ingredients and way of cooking from China and we mix with the local Malay way of cooking to give this beautiful dish. For these kueh kus, what were the Pranakans using it for? Kueh kus is very important for the Pranakans because you use for birthdays. You know the Chinese don't normally give the peach bun. Yeah. For Pranakans, we don't have the peach bun. Mm. We only serve kueh ku. We have the black kueh kus that used for ancestor worship and also we have the white kueh ku and no filling inside. That is for funeral. Mm. Okay, so is my dough all right here? Yes. So now you need to pinch the dough into little balls. Put the ball in, wrap it up. Okay, now the oil comes in. Okay, then the oils come in, then you put it. So every family will have different uh, molds. The molds based on how the family likes the, the tortoise the mold to be. Taste. I realize the size is bigger than yes, the um, Hokkien ones. The Nunya likes the kueku to be big, yeah. The bigger the better it is, yeah. And also they like to have the kueku with the tear, with the leg and the head, everything on it. Ah, I see. Can yeah, you see the tear? I can see that. Yeah. Then the leg, the four legs and the head here. Yeah. So this is actually important to have. Yeah. After that we will steam it. Okay, here comes the Uncle Kui. Mm, wow. Smells good. You taste the difference? Mm. The coconut flavour is very pronounced. And I think I understand why the sweet potato is in there too. I actually can taste the sweet potato yeah, in the skin. It's actually a lot of lemak. Lemak, right? It bursts into your mouth, right? It's, it's really fragrant. Mm. With its distinct appearance and auspicious meanings, the Angku Kue is a food that befits the gods. But if you go closer, it holds a couple of similarities to another kueh, the plainer-looking tutu kueh. Resting on fragrant pieces of banana leaves, both kueh have a sweet filling encased in a layer of skin. They are also a part of the story of Hokkien's in Southeast Asia. But here is where the stories diverge. Chinese migration to Southeast Asia is widely believed to have begun from the Song Dynasty onwards when new policies towards foreign trade in China allowed Chinese merchants and sh shipping to 
venture out of China. The earliest communities in, in Southeast Asia are known to be Hokkien, no, Fujian province in China. But from the Qing Dynasty, especially the 18th century, uh, you see the growing migration of people from other parts of southern China, like the Guangdong areas, partly in response to the growth in demand in China for Southeast Asian products like tin, gold, pepper, gambia. During the 18th century, local rulers in Southeast Asia, as well as the Dutch East India Company, trying to attract more labour from southern China to Southeast Asia. The term Sinke would have been used to distinguish the new migrants from the earlier Chinese migrants. If the Angkukui tells the story of the earlier waves of Chinese migrants to the region, then the equivalent for the new migrants or Sinke has to be the Tutukui. This man was among the first group of people selling it. Originally from Fujian, he ventured out to Nanyang in the 1930s. Now his grandson Cohen is continuing his legacy. When he came here, he didn't have a lot of skills. Lah. So he was introduced to become a barber initially, but didn't make much money. Lah. He was cutting hair at the back alley of the streets. Lah. He came from Fujian, China. Like many immigrants that when they first reach Singapore, they will look for their own clan. He was introduced to Tutukwe because they were already selling Tutukwe. They were like the first batch of pioneers lah, mm. to, to sell Tutukwe here. He started about 1949, after World War II. Lah. And was there Tutukwe back then in Fujian? They have something similar, it's uh, something called Sangkwe. Song Gao. Ingredients would be like rice, water, and sugar and steam. That would be similar to the, the plain tutu kueh that we are selling now. Where was this tutu kueh sold? Back then, there were, there were more than 20 families. So everyone would have uh, their own territory. So if someone was there selling, they wouldn't go. Lah. My grandfather would wake up very early, 3 4 a.m., he would start making. And then uh, he would put it in his cart and then push his cut out. We'll be at uh, Chinatown, la, Orchard, la, and then uh, even Sambawang Woodlands. So why is it called Tutu Kue? There are many stories about how the name came about, but according to my grandfather, because this is a push cut, mm. we use it to push it uh, along the streets. So in Hokkien, when we say push, is two. It's just an easy way for them to name it Tutu Kue. Another reason is that back in the olden days, the steamer is not very nicely done. So when the steam comes out, it creates a two sound. Yeah, but now we cannot relate this anymore because there's no sound here anymore. Another reason might be the ingredients and the shape of the kueh is similar to the Malay putu piring. The main difference is that for the Malay putu piring, the filling is gula malaka and the coconut will be on the outside. For tutu, right, the filling with the coconut and the gula malaka is all in the kueh itself. The kueh tutu is closely related in terms of the texture of the putu piring. I was looking at Songgao, uh, which has been claimed to be the origin of the you know, Kuei Tutu. Uh, but how Songgao was prepared is very different. It's a huge you know, uh, cake that has been cut, as opposed to dainty ones that are made by individual molds. The Songgao is it's firm, it's almost doughy, as opposed to loose, fluffy that we see in Kuei Tutu or in Kutupiring. Kuei Tutu and Kutupiring has the same sort of you know, consistency. The word tutu itself is a derivative of putu. The difference is just one syllable. With food, it's very hard to pin down their origins to a single point. So, it's very possible that the first tutu kueh hawkers drew inspiration from both songkao and putu piring, since they both have been around for a very long time. Hi, Aisha. Hey, hi, Justin. How are you? I'm good. How are you? 
Aisha is the fifth generation owner of this Putu Piring brand that now has seven outlets across Singapore. But during her great grandmother's time, she sold the snack by the roadside. Did she make a lot of money from selling this Putu Piring? Looking at the pictures that my late grandmother showed to me, I can see my great great grandmother wearing gold bangles, uh, especially thick ones at the feet. That's why uh, I think it's quite lucrative during that time. It's also a form of kuih, correct? Yes. But what, what does the putu stand for and what does piring mean? Putu basically means a dessert that is made from rice flour. Piring is a Malay word known as the saucer, a small plate. Putu is a South Indian term for steamed rice cake. Putu piring is closely related to putu bamboo. Putu bamboo refers to rice cake that has been steamed with bamboo. There is such a thing as localization. While putu bamboo has made its way here, but when it's localized, that shape has changed to the shape of a piring, a saucer or a disc. You look around in the Malay world, you find coconut all over and the coconut shell is used as a receptacle. The concavity of the coconut shell with the compacted rice cake, you will get putu piring. Putu uh, has been around for a long time in our region, uh, you know, thanks in part to the Indianization of the region. Southeast Asia was in the Indian sphere of influence from 290 BC till the 15th century. In fact, before the spread of Islam, the Indian religions of Hinduism and Buddhism held sway in the region. And it was the trade during this period of Indian influence that carried many Indian merchants along with their foods to the region. So Aisha, how long have you or your family been making this putu piring? The dessert that you are eating is actually almost a century old because my late great-great-grandmother started since 1930s before the World War II. So that's when we started making putu piring. So during the Japanese occupation, did your family continue selling putu piring? Yes, they did. During World War II, uh, food is very scarce. It's hard to get food anywhere. So when there are street vendors selling food, uh, that's where uh, people like quickly rush and buy some. So that's why I believe uh, last time during my great-great-grandmother time, they are selling quite well. Rice is one of the key ingredients in putu piring. And during the Japanese occupation, rice was rationed. How did your family manage to get hold of this stock? Last time, our family owns a land. So that piece of land, they normally plant some studies. So we have a lot of rice. That's where she started grinding the rice into flour. And then plus coconut, you can find in abundance during the kampung days. So that's where she take down and she literally cooked last time. To still have access to rice under the brutal Japanese rule, Aisha's great-great-grandmother was one of the luckier ones. With shortages, kueh makers had to seek alternatives. This route became the backbone of many kueh's. But why were people still making kueh's during that dark period? Lee Geok Boy wrote about life in Singapore, which was renamed Sionanto under the Japanese occupation. How was hawking affected back then during the Japanese occupation? People sold crockery, uh, furniture, all kinds of stuff appeared in the black market. Food, I'm sure, was sold. Food was the currency. The Japanese currency, the banana money, was highly inflated. People were carrying around with bags of stuff just to buy very simple things. Butter trade was more sensible because you knew what you were getting. Under great oppression, and there's absolutely almost nothing coming in into Singapore in terms of imports. You know, food is in such great shortage. Why do people still make kueh? One, because you could. The ingredients for the simple kueh were available. The nyonya kueh that they made with rice before, they would have had to switch to tapioca. People grew tapioca. Fortunately, you can do quite a few things with tapioca. You can boil, you can bake. There was kueh bingka. And kueh bingka certainly has a different taste from boiled tapioca. 
it's very boring to eat the same thing day after day after day. Yeah. Even in hard times, if you can, try to at least have a change of flavour. Can you show me how to make kueh bingkat? Yeah, sure. Why not? How many ingredients are there? Tapioca, coconut milk and palm sugar. Banana leaf for lining your, your tin and pandan, of course. So, variety of donya kueh were possible because these ingredients were native. Alright, so let's start making it then. Okay. First? First, you have to clean it. No, it's a root. I, I this tapioca was originally covered with dirt <laughs> because it was dug up from the ground. So why was tapioca being planted everywhere? Because one, there was no rice. Only the Japanese, only those with the right connections had uh, access to rice. You had to queue up for food to collect your rations. And which meant hours standing in line just to get your small quota of, of rice, sugar or whatever it was they were giving out for, for that day. A lot of time was spent doing very uh, basic survival stuff. Besides, just because there were ration cards didn't mean that you got the rations. The Shona administration encouraged the population to grow their own vegetables, tapioca and so on, by uh, giving out seeds. They were growing tapioca in, on the Padang, in front of City Hall. And that was... Uh, first thing that was removed when the Japanese surrendered. They cleared the padang of tapioca plants. So who were making this kueh bingkat back then? My grandmother was a nonya. During the Japanese occupation, made kueh for sale. I presume this kueh had been one of the kueh that she made. And my father had to go sell it at the market. So you need a coconut milk. Are you just eyeballing it or is this just by experience? Let me uh, remind you that such things as scales did not exist Good. in those days. <laughs> Everything was the agar aga method. You look at it and say, hmm, I think that's enough. Okay. Or you taste the thing and say, okay, it's sweet enough. So which one is the best piece for you? The best parts are all the more burnt ones, so it's all the outer bits. It's also more chewy. It is quite sticky. It's also more fragrant. Mm. How's it? The char. No, it's not too sweet. So was this kueh created and invented during the Japanese occupation? I don't think so. I think it was a traditional local kueh amongst the Indonesians and, and, and Malays. If this kueh was created before World War II, are there any Dutch or British influence in this kueh? Absolutely not. But the kind of baking that we know of today was definitely from the colonial era. Because wheat flour is a Western uh, European thing. One of the commonest things that you see today is the, the Indonesian kueh lapis. That was definitely a Dutch thing. Uh, it needs wheat flour, it needs butter, lots of butter. And of course, eggs. Every country in the world had eggs because they had chickens. But the butter, the flour, were all European. So roughly when did the Europeans come to Southeast Asia and why? The Portuguese took Malacca, which was a very famous trading port in 1511. And for about 100 years, the Portuguese controlled Malacca. Then came the Dutch. They captured Malacca from the Portuguese. The Dutch came here from the 17th century. 
and they were in competition with the British. And they were both in competition to capture the spice trade in this part of the world. Because uh, spices were all from this part of the world. But why were spices such prized items? To find out, I got in touch with history professor Go Gyok Yen. Spices were extremely coveted items. This was before the age of refrigeration. So meat <laughs> were rot or decompose over a period of time. And so spices helped to mask the taste of rotting meat. They were also used as perfume for medicinal purposes. And because of the fact that uh, spices were difficult to obtain, because we're talking about Southeast Asia, far away from Europe, a lot of distance had to be covered. So even a small batch of it cost a lot of money. It's been said that uh, the spices that are brought back basically is worth its weight in gold. So what spices were they here for in particular? The Europeans were here for quite a number of different spices. And so one good example is the nutmeg. So nutmeg was brought to Singapore by Raffles. So we are standing at the site of what would be the first botanic gardens in Singapore. Here we were surrounded by nutmeg trees. So these were a very sought after item. They originate from um, the eastern Indonesian islands of uh, what we call the Malukas Islands, the Spice Islands. I have one example here as well. That's maize on the exterior and the nutmeg is the interior. So you get two spices out of one. Another key spice that Europeans were interested in is effectively clove. So we're standing right next to a clove tree. It's not floating right now. What they do is they don't wait for the clove's flowers to blossom. They should be actually harvested when they are still a bud. Then you also have cinnamon. That comes from a tree bug. So you have that in Sumatra, much of Indonesia now, in India as well, and Sri Lanka. But there are many varieties of cinnamon. You also get that in southern China as well. Yet another spice would be cardamom, and so you get that in South India. Demand for coveted spices in Europe led them to Southeast Asia, ushering the start to the age of colonialism in the region. I'm a chef. Using spices like these is an everyday practice in the kitchen. By mixing cinnamon, nutmeg and cloves, and then grounding it up, mix a spice mix. That is used in this cake, the Gui Lapis Bikit. The Kuei Lapis Legit subverts all Kuei stereotypes. It's buttery and closer to a cake than a typical Kuei. But it retains that Southeast Asian edge with the distinct taste of warm spices. But how exactly did the arrival of the Europeans birth this cake? Peter Lee is a historian with a keen interest in Southeast Asian history. Peter, you're a historian. Um, amongst all the information that you collect, why do you collect the cookbooks? Now this is the funny thing, I am not a cook at all, but I love cookbooks. They tell me so much about how cultures form. Um, in Southeast Asia in particular, these recipe books have ingredients and methods and dishes that come from everywhere. It, it's really mind-boggling and to see the presence of this kind of hybridity from an early period is very fascinating for me. What is the oldest mention of the Quilapis recipe in your collection? I found the earliest mention of it among the books that I have in a recipe book from 1845. I can show you here. So there is this wonderful recipe for Quilapis and it is written in a vernacular Malay influenced by Dutch spelling. It's really amusing. It has, for example, a pound and a half of butter and 40 eggs, which I think is pretty incredible. What we have in this is a list of ingredients and already I'm fascinated by the fact that it is so hybrid. So you have butter, which is European. You also have a mention of brandy, but also this kulit uh, jeruk china, which is the Chinese orange peels. And then it has cloves, which is local, cinnamon and 
a mixture of ingredients from East and West. Looking at the way the recipe is so mixed up, it might have emerged uh, within a mixed race community. And Batavia or Jakarta, where this recipe book comes from, was so international for a couple of hundred years already, by 1845. Batavia was founded by the Dutch as a colonial city in 1618. And immediately it attracted people from all over. Among them, a large proportion of the Dutch military, for example, uh, came from Germany. Europe at that time was going through a lot of turmoil. You had a lot of poor young men from different parts of Europe wanting work. And the, the Dutch East Indies Company provided employment. So German could have brought this German traditional cake called the Baumkuchen, which might have influenced the early development of the kueh lapis. Mm. The recipe of the kueh lapis back then and today, has it, has it changed much? Has it kept its integrity? There are some people who do the classic Indonesian style. Let's not forget, since Singapore was founded, people have been coming over from different parts of Indonesia. So we are culturally part of the same world. We have people who come from Java or people who have ancestors who came from there. So that's how these recipes ended up being part of our own food tradition. It's not appropriated in the sense that somebody just looked up a recipe book and just copied the recipe. This is food that people grew up with and brought with them. Mm. So it belongs to us as much as it does to um, anywhere else. We mustn't forget that people have been moving around for such a long time. You know? mm. And we can't pretend these links don't exist. In the 1950s, when I was a young kid, I used to visit an Indonesian Chinese family. And one of the things that I got to eat was kueh lapis. Kueh lapis began being sold in the shops when Indonesian Chinese women began making it for sale. One was called Anastasia. And I'm paying Anastasia a visit to find out just what drove her and her kueh lapis legate from Indonesia to the Lion City. How did you learn how to make your kueh lapis? I learned kueh lapis from my mom, my mother. And I was 19. One cake uh, takes two hours to do it. It's um, very difficult, not easy to make. The layer by layer, you can't stop. You can't stop. And then that time, it, we use the you know, charcoal. It's very hot. In Indonesia, we call it spiku. But Anastasia's growing up years was shaken when civil unrest plagued Indonesia from 1965 to 1966. There were large-scale killings targeting communist sympathizers. Many of them were ethnically Chinese. Between 500,000 to 1 million people were killed, according to estimates. While Anastasia survived the ordeal unharmed, she seized an opportunity five years later to settle in Singapore. When did you start making kuih lapis in Singapore? At home. After I give it to my first child, I start to make the cake for my friend, for my relative. Do you still make kuih lapis right now? Uh, yeah, we, we make the kuih lapis in the, our central kitchen. And what's the name of your first shop? Bengawan Solo. Bengawan Solo. The bakery is synonymous with traditional cakes and kuehs. With 40 outlets around Singapore, it's practically a household name. Let me introduce my son, Henry. Hi Henry, nice to meet you. Hi Justin, nice to meet you too. So let's uh, go and see how our kueh lapis is done. Let's go. Let's go, after you. So this is our lapis area. So this is where they're doing the actual baking of the lapis. You can see the layers are all still done by hand, one by one. So it's 18 layers per cake. So Henry, of all the products that Bengwan Solo sells, how popular is the kueh lapis? The kueh lapis is very popular, especially during festive seasons, like Chinese New Year, Christmas. For us, traditionally, it's always been 18 layers. This cake has become very synonymous with 
the symbolism of uh, prosperity, you know, Pupu Kaosheng. People have come to associate this with a festive cake. So Henry, what goes into the batter to make this kuih lapis? Two very important components of uh, kuih lapis is the rempah and the butter. Rempa spice mix. Our spice mix includes things like cinnamon, cloves and other spices. We also use Dutch butter. Why do you use Dutch butter? Most Indonesian recipes, not just kuih lapis, pineapple tarts, cookies, they use this butter because it imparts a quite a unique buttery flavour. It's quite creamy, it's quite rich and when you add it in, you will taste it straight away. I can say that it's so pronounced and quite dominant, this flavour. From Angkor Kwe to Kwe Lapis Legit, each one of these came to be thanks to centuries of migration and cultural mixing. And nothing else represents the melting pot that is Southeast Asia, quite like Kwe.